Hi, welcome back to Ways of Reading. This is our series of conversations from Columbia College here at Columbia University about the books we read in literature humanities, our general education literature seminar for undergraduate students. I'm Joseph Howley. I'm an associate professor of classics here at Columbia, uh, and I'm also the Paul Brook Program Chair for Literature and Humanities. And I'm joined today by Dr. Jacqueline Vaintrib, who's associate professor of Hebrew Bible at Yale Divinity School. Dr. Vaintrib is the author of Beyond Orality, Biblical Poetry on Its Own Terms. She teaches Hebrew Bible and the study of Bible in lots of different classes and contexts. And I'm really delighted that she's joined us today to help us think about the book of Genesis, which is one of the first books we read in literature humanities. Dr. Vaintrib, thanks for joining us. Hi, um, I have some slides um, and I think that'll help us out um, right. when I talk about some things that are deeply familiar to me reading these texts over and over again, but um, can seem sort of <laughs> uh, obscure to people who have never thought about these questions before. So um, hopefully they'll help us along. Fantastic. That's so great. I'm glad we have the benefit of that. And, and you know, as I know from talking to you, there's a lot of stuff here that you teach uh, in your own classes uh, quite a lot. And I'm glad we have the, the benefit of your expertise, not just in the subject matter, but also in the teaching of it. Um, this is uh, the book of Genesis is a scriptural text that is important to a number of traditions, uh, religious traditions, cultural traditions. And one of the things we're going to talk a, li a little bit about today is what it means that we're reading it in a literature class. But I want to start with the question that I've been starting a lot of these conversations with. Uh, and this is a text where it feels kind of funny to ask this question, but uh, let's go for it. Do you remember the first time that you read Genesis? So I have to be honest, I actually don't remember the first time that I've read Genesis. And I think that that might be an answer that many people have with respect to this text. Um, and I think that underscores something really important about how we orient ourselves towards the text. Um, because unlike many different works, which sort of um, may be part of, you know, our cultural um canon uh, that um, we can clearly remember when we read, you know, A Tale of Two Cities or um, The Odyssey. Um, this is not, because this work is so deeply embedded in religious practices, in religious communities, um, and also in Western culture, um, it's not like an ancient text, for example, like the Epic of Gilgamesh or um, some other text that, um, you know, was dug up out of the ground in modern life um, and re-entered our cultural canon, um, you know, in the 19th or 20th century through its, you know, its uh, um, translation and editions. This is a text that, has always been a part of, you know, an idea of Western culture. Um, and for that reason, it's also a really complicated text to talk about and to try to figure out what assumptions you have when you read it. Um, so I want to um, underscore um, one idea that I'm going to come back to over and over again. And that is this term defamiliarizing. And what that means is to make something that would be familiar strange, mm. right? Um, and this is gonna be kind of weird and platonic to talk about it this way, but um, let's talk about a chair, okay? Um, so if I were to say, you know, um, I'm, let's say I'm describing the chair that's right in front of me. Um, and I'm going to say, oh, you know, like its arms jut out and its legs are straight and unadorned. Um, that's language that you are familiar with, right? But what if I was to say, to ask the question, isn't it weird that we talk about a chair like it's a body? Like its arms, its legs. And, you know, to start to think about like, well, like, well, why do we do that? Or what does it mean? Does that have something to do with like the posture we're meant to assume when we sit on it or that we see it as an extension of our bodies and our postures? Now, those are not things that are necessarily true. It's just a way for me to illustrate what it means to take something that's familiar, language that's familiar and make it strange. Um, so like 
then when you hear it over and over again, like, oh, the arms of this chair, you'd be like, oh, it's so weird. Is that because I'm supposed to put my arms there? Like, right. So that's the kind of posture that I want people to take up when they start thinking about this text. But what I want to begin with is um, to try to distinguish between what I'm calling a confessional reading and what I'm trying to bring us towards, which is a literary reading. And that's because there are different aims that belong to each of those kinds of readings. And there's no such thing as a true reading of this text, right? So I want to sort of disabuse everyone of the idea that, you know, a literary reading is a truer reading of the text. Um, I'm not here to, you know, promote capital T truth in any sense. I'm just um, trying to show a different perspective or viewpoint on the text. So in a confessional reading within the sort of like closed circle of a community, a confessional reading holds that the stories you're reading are true events that factually happened, that they are historically factual, and that they also correspond to some sort of theological truth. Okay, I'm not here to really further define that. It's just a way of positioning yourself towards a text that the text is meant to inform you as the present day reader of it, of both something that happened in the past that's true and something that thus informs your behavior in the present, right? Um, that is um, a typical position that people take within religious communities that hold the biblical texts to be their scripture. And can I just, can I just clarify yeah, my, yeah. my understanding of that? So one example of that would be like um, uh, to a reading in which we say, look, it is literally true or it is, it is true that God created the world in the way that's described at the beginning of Genesis. And as a result of that, we have certain commitments today about how we live or or think or practice. Absolutely. So yeah. that is a confessional approach mm -hmm. to, you know, the, the two creation stories that are set side by side in Genesis 1 through 3. Um, a... Now, there's a, a different perspective of reading, which takes them not as just stories, right? Because that is a way of, some people may come from scriptural traditions and see that as a diminishment, right? That seeing these texts um, as human products of literature, right, is a diminishment um, of something that is more lofty and also impinges on your own like um, commitment, right? Commitments to the world. Um, but in fact, it's um, it's simply a different way of describing and understanding the texts through a lens of um, a human um, verbal art, basically. So, um, the way I tend to explain it is that the literary approach lies somewhere between all fact and all fiction. Um, the Bible is not, from this perspective, all fiction, but it's also not all fact. Um, that if you are going to take a literary approach, you wouldn't be committed to um, an idea that, for example, um, you know, Cain and Abel were real personages, right? Um, but you would recognize that the way in which the stories are told reflect a worldview that was real and a material world and life ways that were real. Um, and so in that sense, it lies somewhere between all fact and all fiction. They are a collection of ancient texts and stories with a historical context to them. And it's really important to, um, so I'm going to go back to this word of defamiliarizing, that many people who are familiar with the stories in Genesis um, may be deeply familiar with, for example, certain English translations of the stories and the words. They may be deeply familiar with 
the plot of the stories or the relationship between certain episodes. Um, and sometimes knowing something really well keeps you from seeing things that teach you new ways of seeing the text. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, if you were to take the two creation stories, the first one where the world is created in seven days, right? Um, in this sort of magisterial creation of um, God, you know, speaking creation into being through his speech. Um, uh, and also the, you know, the creation of all the elements of the world um, ending with the creation of humankind, male and female, right? Um, as sort of like equal fitted parts, right? Um, at the same time, right? Um, some people may be accustomed to seeing that and the subsequent story as ones that go together, that are naturally um, connected um, as part of the same overarching story. But a literary approach would look to see what are the conflicts between those two stories um, that aren't trying to harmonize them, but let them be strange for what they are, right? So that in the first episode, right, male and female are created together, but in the second, right, they're created at different points in time, right, um, or the order of creation is different, um, that you might be able to then posit that there are different ideas being expounded in each of those two creation stories and appreciate them without having to challenge your overarching commitment to the Bible as scripture. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what I'm trying to advocate is that you can appreciate the things that are challenging um, from a perspective of like a coherent truth, right? Um, you're able to, you know, appreciate them without, you know, negating whatever previous commitments you have to the text. And that's just something that I wanted to underscore because I think that um, in my experience of teaching this, um, uh, you know, the introduction to the Hebrew Bible, and of course, Genesis at the beginning of um, such a course, um, uh, a lot of um, a lot of readers tend to um, struggle with uh, conflicting commitments to the text. Um, and one of the, um, if I can add like um, a technique that I use, it's like um, like just a personal technique that I think students have found helpful in doing this is that um, if you find it to be um, difficult or challenging um, in a sort of um, terms in terms of your religious commitments to um, keep two separate notebooks um, where you physically separate out the observations that you could, you know, call literary observations of the text. And then maybe the more sort of um, spiritual confessional commitments that you have towards that text in a separate notebook so that you're not diminishing them. You're just separating them out as part of a different kind of intellectual project. Um, if that makes sense. I love that idea. I love the two notebooks. That seems like such a great, a great way of, um, of reflecting on it for ourselves as readers, reflecting on the different kinds of reactions and, and responses we can have. This distinction you're making also makes me think about the way that um, even for readers who don't have a, um, uh, a strong confessional um, background, a uh, relationship with the text, they can come to it um, with their encounter mediated by the um, millennia of effects that that previous people's commitments to the text have had on other forms of art uh, or literature or religion that they produce. And, and this is a kind of like almost comically simple example, but I find it helpful every year to ask my students, um, what is the fruit that gets eaten in the garden that confers the knowledge of good and evil. And everyone says apple. Everyone says apple. I've seen the paintings. I know it's an apple. Obviously it's an apple. 
Yeah, and I mean, depending on which you know period of art you're looking at, yeah. Exactly, right. So, I mean, you're the professor of Hebrew Bible. What is it? What is the fruit? It's just a fruit. It's just a fruit. Isn't that interesting? And indeed, there have been places and times when it was a pomegranate, right? Um, I mean, there's there's certainly, you know, a, a whole sort of um, uh, lexical, le like list of lexical factoids I could give you um, that I'm, I'm not going to go into. Um, although those who are interested might have some fun doing some digging online. You can do your own deep Wikipedia dive if you'd like, um, if you're watching this video. Um, but but um, one of the things that I think is important, I mean, this is a perfect example that you've given, um, because what happens when we start to say like, okay, well, maybe in, you know, certain artworks, it's been represented as an apple or as a pomegranate. What if we go back to the text and see that it's fruit? And what does that, you know, what are we, what are we then meant to focus on? We're meant to focus on the fact that the strangeness of the fact that, okay, like, let's forget about apples or pomegranates. Why are there magical trees in this garden? <laughs> right? Like, yeah. like that is to me, like a better question of like, oh, wait, like what's going on in this story? Like, why are there, first of all, how many trees are there? I mean, like unclear, right. maybe just these two, maybe a bunch of trees and only these two are distinctive. Right. And then, like these two magical trees are sort of representative of qualities that confer upon the people who consume of it two qualities that make them godlike, which through that you can actually understand like a native theology that's like in the story of like what what is there in just in the confines of that story itself? Like, don't try to harmonize it with any other, you know, account. What kind of God is this? Right. Um, and what like it's a way of describing the religious imagination just from that story itself, that what makes humans like God and what makes them different from God shows you what God is, which is, you know, first of all, the tree of it's not the tree of good and evil, right? It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? Which is, um, you know, the capacity to discern between one thing and another, which is why after one has consumed of it, one notices that they look different naked than the other person standing in front of them because they can tell the difference between things, right? You look down, you look over there, something looks different, right? Um, so I, I like, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot more that's sort of packed into those stories, but just sort of starting to notice, you know, really on like the, a very sort of like almost boring basic level, like what do the words say, right? right? What does it mean that you have trees that are life-giving? Well, you know, there's a lot of, um, this goes into the kind of a kind of um, defamiliarizing, also decolonializing practice of reading the Bible as an ancient Middle Eastern artifact and not as something that belongs. It has come to belong to Western traditions, but not that something that was a product of Western traditions. Mm -hmm. It is a product of its own place and time with a whole bunch of um neighboring not influences just contexts right like neighboring contexts um so you have all this iconography from the ancient middle east of trees of life um and what those represent and so this story is kind of told um in um you know on the background you know its motifs come from that background and you can learn a lot about you know the different sort of meanings embedded in the stories by understanding more about that background and what isn't, you know, a, what is a tree of life? You know, what are, what is that, what is that image making about? Right. Um, uh, oftentimes it looks a lot like, um, uh, you know, animals that are, that are nursing from a breast. Um, you have in this story, a woman giving an apple. It's a kind of like a, there's a kind of, perhaps like a nursing motif going on there. Um, uh, this sort of like these ideas of, um, 
you know, taking what is familiar of like the familiar components of human society and then retrojecting them back to an initial creation moment. Um, and that says a lot about what people think about the basic components of human society, mm -hmm. right? Which might be different from ours or maybe similar. There may be some overlap. This is um, really, I think one of the things that that is emerging from our conversation here is, um, you know, there's other things that we are reading in this course that are going to be more or less unfamiliar to everyone in the class. And here we're talking about a text that in various ways can feel very familiar to lots of people. And the defamiliarization you're talking about is, is I think, giving us a way of thinking about, like, what are the layers we can sort of move yeah. aside and still find ourselves looking at the same um, looking at the same thing. Um, and uh, this, I think, gets us to one of the things I think of as being essential about literature, which is that um, we might all be sitting there with the book in front of us. Um, but but, you know, the book is a it's it's moving. It's sort of vibrating. It has this kind of like quantum um, uncertainty to it because our acts of interpretation and response are always sort of making it anew. Schrodinger's Bible. Right. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I think, okay, so there's two things. I want to get back here yeah. uh, to some of my um, uh, sort of helpful uh, framing. So the first, I have sort of two takeaways built into this. So there's many versions of the Bible with differences between them, which have to be evaluated. Um, and before I even go into this, I mean, like, everyone is going to be reading a translation of the Bible, right? Um, and through reading translation, I, I don't know if everyone's meant to read the same translation or different translations, but I mean, there's a whole sort of like, there's a whole rabbit hole that you could go down of just the history of translating the Bible. Um, and as, especially as, um, especially in a course that is um, talking about the humanities and literature, um, uh, both Western and non-Western literatures, um, uh, you know, the concepts of canon, concepts, uh, even like the English language itself has been formed out of um, English Bible translation right. to such an extent that like, um, there's uh, some like fascinating factoids. I'll throw one out there. Um, the word to fornicate is a biblical word. It is a weird biblical word that um, combines the Latin fornix with Greek porne mm -hmm. um, um, in order to get something across that's actually like not part of like the English language and builds within it a kind of um, moral, like a moralizing of um, a term in Hebrew, zana, which actually means um, different things in different contexts, but um, it's not just sex work. It's also, um, it, it usually means to like, you know, to translate um, illicit sexual behavior, but it builds within it a whole sort of patriarchal worldview that is native to the biblical texts for sure, mm -hmm. but also uh, moralizes it in some ways, in some ways that the biblical text does in certain texts, right? In Cir for example, in Ezekiel, but in other texts would not moralize it. Um, and it kind of gives it like a blanket more moralizing that you wouldn't otherwise have. And that's a term that in English now only means one thing, right? right? Um, and it comes out of Bible translation. And there are so many other words like this. Yeah. So our whole, I, like, there's actually no way to do this without like deconstructing the whole English language, <laughs> which makes it a very complicated task, but also makes it fun and new and fresh and weird, yeah. right? Um, so like, you know, like the phrase to like, to lift your eyes is actually like not native to English before right. pre, you know, before Bible translations. Right. Um, so, okay. There are many versions of the Bible with differences between them. Um, also a literary perspective will um, take the biblical texts as a human product. And therefore it went through many stages in its growth. And there's even, you know, multiple canons. So um, I have a kind of definition of canon here that um, is, is very just like um, utilitarian, um, but um, using it to talk about the different um, 
canons of biblical text, and I'll just go through here um, to show you something. Um, so I have here a kind of like a list of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different um, seven seven different um, biblical canon uh, canonical traditions, just to show how. In some senses, they are consistent with each other, and in others, they're wildly inconsistent with each other. Um, so, like the red means um, certain texts are not included. Um, so, you can see here once you get down, this is like further down in the list of the texts, that some of them <laughs> are like you know present in you know in in the Ethiopic tradition and just completely virtually unknown in the protestant tradition and so when you say the bible um what you're meaning what what you're saying is not just that the bible is first of all not just one text it is many different texts compiled uh, you know from many different authorial hands over you know hundreds of years but also doesn't mean the same thing to every community right. um and so so that you know is a kind of way of also defamiliarizing what you mean by Bible. Um, and what you mean by Bible in a certain sense is, you know, a kind of like conceptual container that you're putting in um, basically this, <laughs> right. um, uh, um, which is, you know, the, um, the Protestant configuration of, um, or the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish configuration of the, of the Hebrew Bible. Um, the Protestant configuration has a different um, order of it because it takes the Greek translate the Greek Jewish Greek translation the Septuagint um, and shifts things um, so that the order reflects a very specific idea that those translators had of authorship um, in sort of in brief um, so so that's you know and another thing I want to point out is that you're only reading Genesis <laughs> that's like that that part right there yeah and. Genesis is part of, um, let's see here, a narrative history. And this narrative history begins in Genesis, ends in 2 Kings, and then is resumed again in Ezra, Nehemiah, and First and Second Chronicles. Um, and so what you see there is, first of all, an overarching story. So Genesis is the beginning of this sort of um, national story, the story of, you know, a of a people and its God um, uh, set, you know, in history um, on the backdrop of, you know, already, already written. Um, let's see if I can show this, right. The history of writing in ancient Israel. Um, and I think this is kind of a helpful um, way of seeing um, way of um, debunking kind of the idea, like the Bible is the oldest texts we have like you know when the biblical text is being you know when they're being authored um the first biblical text being authored i have here somewhere around 8th century bce i don't really know i mean no one really knows yeah. um that's still pretty late in the game if you compare it to the history of writing in the ancient middle east yeah. you have writing already sort of invented in the third millennium bce Look how look how long that is. I mean, yeah. so like when you know when the ancient Israelites are writing about God's creation of the world, there were already many different ideas of what the creation of the world might have looked like. Yeah, in, in another one of these um, videos, we uh, have a conversation about the Epic of Gilgamesh, which we read prior to Genesis. And um, Sophus Hella, the translator of, of Gilgamesh, um, uh, reminded me in that conversation that when Gilgamesh became a literary text, it was already for its readers about someone who lived a long time ago. Yeah, I and, mean, like, and, see down there. Right. See and Gilgamesh in the story, <laughs> Gilgamesh decides that he wants to go talk to Utanapishti, the survivor of the flood. So he goes and finds a guy who was born a long time ago. And when that guy tells the story <laughs> of living before the flood, the first thing he says about the city he lived in is the city was already old. So there's yeah. like... There's, yeah, there's I, no first to get back to, right? Right. I think this is actually like such an important theme about these kinds, like this, um, this kind of writing, right? Like this kind of writing um, 
history isn't the right term, but uh, like I'm just using it like in in play. I, maybe narrative histories because I'm not talking about historical fact in like a kind of scientific way, mm. but in terms of like a narrative of the past. So like how you talk about like a lot of these texts are about um, our way of kind of romanticizing the past mm. or thinking about the past, and it's about like thinking about yourself through the past. Right. yourself in the present or your society in the present right. through the past. And that's what a lot of these texts are doing. And that that's part of the reason why they're so fixated on the authority of the past, because a lot of times that's how they derive their own authority. Um, something I wanted to also um, bring up here is that anonymous authorship in the ancient world was the standard. Yeah. This is not like, this is something that's really important for us to also emphasize. It's weird how like I I um I like to say that like um tablet technology is coming full circle. Like, you know, we used to have tablets, you know, in antiquity. Right. That's how we wrote. And now we have tablets and we're writing on them again. Um we used to have anonymous authorship. Um oh. and then, you know, uh and then we developed um a whole set of um principles on um, on intellectual property and weirdly now with our technologies not just wikipedia with ai we're coming full circle back to anonymous authorship mm -hmm. um something to think about um but in like the worlds that we're talking about anonymous authorship was the standard right and and, and you you don't just mean i'm going to write something but i'm going to put it out into the world and not tell anyone that i wrote it you you mean a, a society of text and culture where when you encounter a text, you don't, the first thing you think is not, well, who wrote this, right? That it's normal for texts to just be and not have an author associated with it. Yeah, I mean, okay, so let's let's unpack that a little bit. Um, I wouldn't say just be, I would say that mm. it's normal. Like if I'm trying to, and a lot of like the way I think about these texts are like my sort of interpretive stance is like a kind of critical empathy that I'm trying to cultivate. So like, mm -hmm. okay, trying to think about like, you know, what does an ancient reader know? What do you, like, what kind of things are they thinking about? What kind of question would they come to a text with, right? Yeah. Um, and I think a question they'd come to a text with is not who wrote this, because that's kind of a question, I think, in their worlds of scribalism. And I think their question would be, whose voice is this, yeah. right? And when you start asking whose voice is this, it doesn't have necessarily anything to do with, you know, um who penned it whose hand inscribed it but rather whose sort of like immortal voice mm. is um like reverberates in the text right. Right. what language does it use what themes does it propound what lessons is it teaching and those kinds of you know what genre is it in and those are the kinds of qualities that it has that will make it a distinctive voice right. and um that voice, you know, can draw on the authority of like figures that lived before, right? So the instructions of Kagemni, right? This ancient Egyptian text, right? It's language, it's vocabulary, all of its versions date to the 20th century BCE, but the person, this historical personage lived in the 27th century BCE, right? And so this is an important thing. It's like people were not committing fraud by writing these things. Right. They felt that they were authentically channeling a voice mm. and this was and this voice had both authority and prestige and you know uh and sort of aesthetic qualities to it um that made it part of that um and i think it also goes back to this this is going to be a kind of um slightly arcane thing to talk about but um our um representational practices Right. Like the way we think about like we're deeply <laughs> influenced by, you know, Aristotle. We're deeply influenced by an understanding of representation as something that is like an like an imitation of something mm -hmm. that it's imitating something as opposed to to a creation, a, something that is meant to manifest something. And in the ancient Middle East, a lot of um, both visual and verbal 
representations were meant to manifest something and not just um, and not just um, imitate it. It wasn't thought to be something that was not real. It was actually real, the thing. So a statue of the god was the god, yeah. right? Um, and it could both be made of human hands and be real at the same time. And in that sense, that might help people who who find it sort of troubling to think that this is the word of God and this is like human made literature. Well, mm -hmm. you'd be very much in line with the way, you know, its authors would have thought about it. Right. Um, they were manifesting a divine word and creating something in the same time. Um, right. Um, I have a thousand questions, but <laughs> what do you think we should know? Well, like, what comes <laughs> next as we're sort of building our apparatus for encountering this? Actually, that's a kind of fun thing to talk about. Um, and that has to do with um, sort of like what we're talking about in terms of the book of Genesis or the Bible, the word in Hebrew for book, and this gets back to like, I, I, I like to always bring us back to the material world out of which these texts came um, because that's another way of defamiliarizing what we're reading because everything we're reading is so much like we think of books um, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of actual like, um, you know, early modern print culture, we think of, um, we don't think of them as scrolls, we don't think of them as tablets. And I want to like sort of reorient us back to how ancient readers and audiences would be encountering this. Um, so first of all, um, very few people were literate. Um, to read, that term to read in Hebrew actually means to call out. So to call something by a name is the same word as to read something. So people aren't just like sitting there and reading things to themselves. Um, they're calling them out. And calling things out brings them into being. Um, uh, the word for, Seth, I have here the word for book in Hebrew is actually inscribed text. And actually that's not even like, that's not even what that <laughs> word means. That word actually means like account. Right. Um, so like, here's what we might be thinking of if you're going back to like 10th century BCE Phoenician inscription, the Gezer calendar. Um, this, this is like, you know, what an inscribed text might look like. This is a 7th century BCE uh, Hebrew legal, legal inscription on, you know, the ancient equivalent of a post-it note, right? These are just like the, like the trash of the ancient world, just broken pottery vessels um, that, you know, you write on and, right. um, the, the the funny thing about this has to do with the materials that were used for writing these um, these you know important scriptural documents, um, which was either papyrus or vellum, right, or some kind of um, you know animal skin, um, as opposed to you know these sort of um, quotidian right. uh, works. Um, the irony there is you know um, through the passage of time and the elements it is these like quotidian pieces that have survived the best and the things on papyrus and animal skin not have not fared as well. Um, and so that's a kind of like interesting irony, but the other thing to think about um, that um, I've been recently thinking about, and it might be a fun thing um, to think about is the fact that these texts were inscribed on skins of animals. Um, and in later scriptural traditions, especially in later Jewish traditions, um, these texts, you know, were understood to be bodies in themselves. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, Torah scrolls would be dressed up in their finery. Um, they were treated like bodies. You'd read them with a yad, which is like a hand. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so, like, they were made of skin, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, they they had sort of like a corporeality to them. Um, and that's another sort of like dimension of it that, it, that we tend to forget, um, that like these are these are stories, you know, like especially Genesis, like the story of creation and stories of, you know, like sort of narrowing the focus of the story from like all of creation to the selection of one people or one nation um, on, you know, on uh, with a pro with certain promises that are made to them um, and their travails and travels. Um, uh and it's, you know, sort of like the connection of like families to lands and lands to families and also bodies to lands and lands to bodies. And there's mm -hmm. that whole element that's like that the 
book of Genesis is sort of suffused with um, that I think is a really interesting one to pay attention to as well. That's great. We were we were um, in uh, reminded to talk about this because off mic I was looking at some of the teaching materials in my classroom and I I have this uh, this sheepskin which which I use for teaching a you know very similar version of what you're talking about and and it's a it's a reminder that if you're going to put a manuscript on parchment you start with this you start with an animal skin and you have yeah. to clean it and dry it and stretch it um, and also how long it is how long right. the text is that you have is constrained how many by animals. yeah I mean. And do you have like the ability to stitch them together? Like, right. so there's so much of like the material production of text right. that goes in that, that like determines, you know, what stories are included, what stories are left out, what pieces you know, like, um, so there's so much of that also. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm mindful of, of time. Um, is there, is there any one thing you want to make sure we talk about before we conclude? Um, or I can sort of give us a concluding question. So there's, there's one episode, um, uh, um, right after creation, there's the first murder. Um, and I think this is a fascinating way of telling the story. Um, but, um, I'm hopeful that, um, uh, readers will get a chance to pay attention to. There's one little piece of it that goes back to, um, what I mentioned about the, um, the text itself as a body that's like speaking, right? And I've mentioned, you know, how um, authorship was anonymous um, in the ancient world um, and that the first question an ancient reader might ask of a text is not, you know, who wrote this, but what voice does it project? Um, and we're talking about something literally orally projected because reading is speaking aloud. Um, that um, after, um, so after, Cain um, murders Abel, right? And one of the things I want to mention is that Abel's name actually means vapor, hevel. The word is actually the same word that's used for the motto in the book of Ecclesiastes, which is all like vanity of vanities, all is vanity. That's the same word and actually means something like vapor or ephemera. And um, something to pay attention to when reading Genesis is how the names of characters function really centrally in the meaning making of the stories. Um, and sometimes it takes a little digging um, and sometimes it's like super ironic. Um, Abel's name means ephemera, right? He's only around for but a breath, right? And then he's killed. Um, but what happens after he dies is his blood is soaked up by the ground. And then the ground, his blood inside the ground cries out. It actually like takes up a voice and cries out. And the the verb for crying out, sa'ak in Hebrew, actually means to make an, a, an appeal to justice. Um, it's seeking vengeance. And the way it seeks vengeance is through cursing Cain, who can no longer produce, make agricultural products from the ground because his brother's blood has cursed it. Um, and so... There's a whole sort of play that's like bound up in there that sets the stage for why civilization is evil um, and how like, you know, you have the creation story, you have um, like the, the banishment from the garden um, and then you have the first murder and you have a civilization. So Cain's name means established. That's like built up. Everything's built up from Cain. Abel's only around for a, a breath, but everything is built up from Cain, which means all of civilization comes from a murderer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's a really interesting way of framing wow. human human society. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, sort of something to think about. Something I always um, talk about with my students when we get to Virgil's Aeneid um, is the beginning and end of the poem, which for a long time people thought, um, that the Aeneid um, must be unfinished because it ends on such an abrupt and upsetting note. Um, and one of the ways we you know- you have Hollywood then, right? No, well, exactly. It's very cinematic. Um, uh, one of the ways we know that it ends exactly where the author meant it to is that in the opening lines, um, the, the, the narrator promises um, that they're going to tell um, about how it is that Aeneas came to found the city of Rome. And the, the Latin verb 
for founding, condere, um, it literally means to sink a foundation into the earth. And um, in the closing lines of the poem, um, uh, Aeneas uh, has defeated the Latin prince um, that he has to, he has to sort of like, for, for the prophecy of Rome to be fulfilled, the Trojans and the Latins have to intermarry to create this new people of the Romans, but war has come. And so instead of joining together, they're fighting. And uh, Aeneas has, um, uh, has this guy uh, on his knees and the guy surrenders and he says, okay, fine. Um, you know, you can marry the princess. We can become one people. And Aeneas is about to take his hand and create peace. And then he's reminded of how angry he is at this guy. And so instead he kills him. And um, the verb that's used for uh, um, for plunging the sword into oh, Turnus' it's, body it's, it's the is the same verb that you use to found a city. It's very much the same kind of move yeah. that you're talking yeah. about here. And it and it it sends a it, it sort of asks a similar question, which is like, is this where we all come from? Is is all of our sort of civilization and culture built on on this kind of like transgression and on the violence of of, of murder? And I think in both cases, right, the, and this is kind of like a, like a very sort of Mediterranean way of thinking of the past, but like mm -hmm. in both cases, um, the past lies in the ground, yeah. right? Yeah. So like Abel's blood is soaked up from the ground and continuing to curse Cain and his descendants, right? Um, and in the case of the Aeneid, right, the foundation is plunged and is set within the ground, right? Yeah. Um, and it's this idea of like, all of ancient history is in the ground, which is actually true. I mean, like they, they themselves saw tells, they saw these ancient mounds, right. right. Where, where ruins existed. Um, and like part of telling a story is like sort of unearthing you yeah. unearth all kinds of, you know, the ground is, is like a, is a dirty place. First of all, it's literally dirty. It's full right. of dirt and it's also full of, of corpses, right. Yeah. And the ground is also where you go when you die. So there's a lot in there of, you know, what does it mean? The foundations of civilization are in the ground. They're in the ground. They're with dead people. They're also with all past manner of sins mm -hmm. um, and things like that. So there's something about this. Um, um, I mean, I, I think what you've just taken us to is one of the ways in which this kind of attentive literary reading of texts that defamiliarizes them and thus allows us to access what's really happening in them and on some other level is on the one hand, a way of accessing the worldview and experiences of, and concerns of people who lived a long time ago, and is also a way of accessing things in the text that are um, very timeless and common and urgent to us. Like, what do we do with the presence of the past, you know, in the earth beneath our feet and all around us? And, and that is, in a sense, the question we have in a class like this, where we have, we are surrounding ourselves in old books, we are immersing ourselves in old ideas. I mean, and this thing is actually not like, that distant from like this phenomenon is not that distant um, for us. So you were to drive around Detroit, you would see, you know, the the wreckage of um, of a certain kind of industry mm -hmm. in in our country. Like, I mean, you see like an actual ghost town. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, this is this is like a concern that you know we all have of like what do we do with our past, right? Yeah. 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 Well, I think that's a great place to end. Dr. Vaintrip, thank you so much for taking the time sure. to talk to me about this.